the man and the opportunity. No man is born into this world whose work is not born with him. Lowell. Things don't turn up in this world until somebody turns them up. Garfield. Vigilance in watching opportunity, tact and daring in seizing upon opportunity, force and persistence in crowding opportunity to its utmost of possible achievement. These are the martial virtues which must command success. Austin Phelps. I will find a way or make one. There never was a day that did not bring its own opportunity for doing good that never could have been done before and never can be again. W. H. Burley Are you in earnest? Seize this very minute. What you can do or dream you can, begin it. If we succeed, what will the world say? asked Captain Berry in delight when Nelson had explained his carefully formed plan before the Battle of the Nile. There is no if in the case, replied Nelson. That we shall succeed is certain. Who may live to tell the tale is a very different question. Then, as his captains rose from the council to go to their respective ships, he added, Before this time tomorrow, I shall have gained a peerage or Westminster Abbey. His quick eye and daring spirit saw an opportunity of glorious victory, where others saw only probable defeat. Is it possible to cross the path? asked Napoleon of the engineers who had been sent to explore the dreaded pass of St. Bernard. Perhaps, was the hesitating reply. It is within the limits of possibility. Ford, then, said the little corporal, without heeding their account of apparently insurmountable difficulties. England and Austria laughed in scorn at the idea of transporting across the Alps, where no wheel had ever rolled, or by any possibility could roll. An army of 60,000 men with ponderous artillery, tons of cannonballs and baggage, and all the bulky munitions of war. But the besieged Messenia was starving in Genoa, and the victorious Austrians thundered at the gates of Nice, and Napoleon was not the man to fail his former comrades in their hour of peril. When this impossible deed was accomplished, some saw that it might have been done long before. Others excused themselves from encountering such gigantic obstacles by calling them insuperable. Many a commander had possessed the necessary supplies, tools, and rugged soldiers, but lacked the grit and resolution of Bonaparte, who did not shrink from mere difficulties, however great, but out of his very need made and mastered his opportunity. Grant at New Orleans had just been seriously injured by a fall from his horse when he received orders to take command at Chattanooga, so sorely beset by the Confederates that its surrender seemed only a question of a few days, for the hills around were all aglow by night with the campfires of the enemy, and supplies had been cut off. Though in great pain, he immediately gave directions for his removal to the new scene of action. On transport up the Mississippi, the Ohio, and one of its tributaries, on a litter borne by horses for many miles through the wilderness, and into the city at last on the shoulders of four men, he was taken to Chattanooga. Things assumed a different aspect immediately. A master had arrived who was equal to the situation. The army felt the grip of his power. Before he could mount his horse, he ordered an advance, and although the enemy contested the ground inch by inch, the surrounding hills were soon held by Union soldiers. Were these things the result of chance, or were they compelled by the indomitable determination of the injured general? Did things adjust themselves, 
when Horatius, with two companions, held 90,000 Tuscans at bay until the bridge across the Tiber had been destroyed, when Leonidas, at Thermopylae, checked the mighty march of Xerxes, when Themistocles, off the coast of Greece, shattered the Persian Armada, when Caesar, finding his army hard-pressed, seized spear and buckler, fought while he reorganized his men and snatched victory from defeat, when Winkelfried gathered to his heart a sheaf of Austrian spears, thus opening a path through which his comrades pressed to freedom. When, for years, Napoleon did not lose a single battle in which he was personally engaged, when Wellington fought in many climes without ever being conquered, when Ney, on a hundred fields, changed apparent disaster into brilliant triumph, when Perry left the disabled Lawrence, rode to the Niagara, and silenced the British guns. When Sheridan arrived from Winchester, just as the Union retreat was becoming a rout, and turned the tide by riding along the line. When Sherman, though sorely pressed, signaled his men to hold the fort, and they, knowing that their leader was coming, held it. History furnishes thousands of examples of men who have seized occasions to accomplish results deemed impossible by those less resolute. Prompt decision and whole-souled action sweep the world before them. True, there has been but one Napoleon, but on the other hand, the apps that oppose the progress of the average American youth are not as high or dangerous as the summits crossed by the great Corsican. Don't wait for extraordinary opportunities. Seize common occasions and make them great. On the morning of September 6, 1838, a young woman in the Longstone Lighthouse between England and Scotland was awakened by shrieks of agony rising above the roar of wind and wave. A storm of unwanted fury was raging and her parents could not hear the cries. But a telescope showed nine human beings clinging to the windlass of a wrecked vessel whose bow was hanging on the rocks half a mile away. We can do nothing, said William Darling, the lightkeeper. Ah yes, we must go to the rescue, exclaimed his daughter, pleading tearfully with both father and mother, until the former replied, Very well, Grace, I will let you persuade me though it is against my better judgment. Like a feather in a whirlwind, the little boat was tossed on the tumultuous sea, but, borne on the blast that swept the cruel surge, the shrieks of those shipwrecked sailors seemed to change her weak sinews into cords of steel. Strength her thirto, unsuspected, came from somewhere, and the heroic girl pulled one oar in even time with her father. At length, the nine were safely on board. God bless you, but you're a bonny English lass, said one poor fellow, as he looked wonderingly upon this marvellous girl, who that day had done a deed which added more to England's glory than the exploits of many of her monarchs. If you will let me try, I think I can make something that will do, said a boy who had been employed as a scullion at the mansion of Signe Faliero, as the story is told by George Carey Eagleston. A large company had been invited to a banquet, and just before the hour the confectioner, who had been making a large ornament for the table, sent word that he had spoiled the piece. You! exclaimed the head servant in astonishment. And who are you? I am Antonio Canova the grandson of Pisano, the stonecutter, replied the pale-faced little fellow. And pray, what can you do? asked the majordomo. I can make you something that will do for the middle of the table, if you'll let me try. The servant was at his wit's end. 
so he told Antonio to go ahead and see what he could do. Calling for some butter, the scullion quickly molded a large crouching lion, which the admiring major domo placed upon the table. Dinner was announced, and many of the most noted merchants, princes, and noblemen of Venice were ushered into the dining room. Among them were skilled critics of artwork. When their eyes fell upon the butter lion, they forgot the purpose for which they had come in their wonder at such a work of genius. <laughs>